Welcome to Golf Smarter Mulligans, number 54. I'm Fred Green. Our guest in today's episode is Eric Alpenfels, who is still the director of golf instruction at Pinehurst Resort. And, uh, well, uh, I'll let the 2008 Fred do this intro. Welcome and thanks for downloading another episode of the Golf Smarter podcast. Back in 2005, Golf Magazine published a cover story by Eric Alpenfels, Ph.D. Bob Christina, and Ph.D. Carrie Heath. Now, they've fleshed out that article and expanded it into a new book that is just being released called Instinct Putting. Putt your best using the breakthrough science-based target vision putting technique. Eric Alpenfels, who's the director of golf course instruction for Pinehurst, has appeared twice on Golf Smarter back in October and November of 2006. If you've ever played or are planning to play Pinehurst, make sure you check out the overview and tea tour that Eric provides of those courses on those episodes. But today, we're talking about putting. Welcome back, Eric. Well, thank you, Fred. Appreciate it. It's great to have you on again in uh, different circumstances this time, but all about the same thing. We're going to talk about golf. And you are creating, it seems like, perhaps a new paradigm shift in putting. Wow, that's a uh, that's a that's a lot. But hopefully, uh, <laughs> hopefully, we're uh, giving some folks who uh, enjoy putting and maybe struggle with a little bit of putting, and maybe some of those folks as well, uh, a chance to take a little different approach and improve their uh, stroke overall and in their performance for sure. All right. So the name of the book is called Instinct Putting, uh, yes, subtitled sir. "Put Your Best Using the Breakthrough Science-Based Target Vision Putting Technique." Now, interestingly <laughs> enough, when I got the book and I read through it quickly, it's not that big a book, so you can really get the point quickly and, and start uh, using the method. I went out to my local practice putting green, and I was watching people putt, and then I was trying this and doing different things. And some guy comes over and starts putting, and he's looking at the target. I'm like, excuse me, do you know about this book, Instinct Putting? And he went, no, what are you talking about? I said, well, you're looking at the target when you putt. He goes, I always have. It just makes more sense to me. It's just easier for me. <laughs> and I was about that? blown away by it. And then actually, uh, I was having a conversation with Jim Waldron over at Balance Point uh, Golf Schools. Mm -hmm. And he says he's been teaching this method of putting since 1996. How about that? You know, he says especially for long putts outside of 40 feet. So I'm just blown away by this. So why don't you give us an overview of the book? Why don't you tell us what the idea is, what your method is, and why you believe in it? Sure. Well, I, and I appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk a little bit about it. It's, it's been a very interesting uh, journey for us, uh, learning about and uh, looking at different styles, uh, different ways to uh, improve your, your putting. And really the, the start of this was a couple years ago with a request by Golf Magazine to uh, study ways that uh, could take the average golfer and help them improve their distance control and putting. And one of the things that uh, Dr. Christine and I were looking at were different routines and practice that would benefit the golfer when it came to distance and control, uh, specifically that issue. And over time, we saw a pattern that if the golfer was looking at the hole, whether they were doing it in a practice stroke or eventually we had them practice distance control putts, uh, while they're looking at the hole, it just seemed to be more effective. Now, it, it it's, you know certainly makes sense that if I'm going to throw a a football, I'm looking at the the maybe the the tight end who's running across the field to throw it to, versus looking at the football while I'm throwing it. So, I mean, a lot of a lot of common sense with the idea of why it would make sense to look at the hole, get a sense of the amount of stroke that's necessary to get the ball to the hole, and uh, as we are showing in the book that. You know, for some people, the technique of actually looking at the hole while they putt for distance putts or and even relatively short putts is uh, pretty effective. So uh, let, let's – it's an amazing concept. So you talk about throwing a football or you're throwing a pitch or you're throwing darts. We're always looking at our target. Mm -hmm. But when you're putting, you're looking at a target, trying to remember the target as you look at the ball, right? And yes. and, and then you go ahead – so where is that breakdown um, in, in understanding your distance when you take your eye off the target and now you're focused on a different target, perhaps? You're not even, now you change your target, right? 
Yeah, I think it really goes down to a lot of golfers that I observe in our golf schools as well as just out on the golf course. So often they stand over the putt and they linger for so long looking at the golf ball and they start trying to think in terms of the mechanics of their stroke that the, the focus really shifts from the distance to strictly the mechanics of the motion and it just makes it harder for them. And probably a little bit of it's the short-term memory that if you're looking, the time it takes you to look at the hold and look at the golf ball, you know, short-term memory only lasts about seven seconds. So if you linger over the golf ball much longer than that, now you really don't even recall the distance or you, can, you can't even imagine the, the distance that you're putting. So it's just it's a combination of things. I think a lot of times the golfers I deal with, they get so mechanical that now their eyes are even tracking the direction the putter's going in. What's the face look like? And they start manipulating things where basically looking at the hole takes a lot of that manipulation away, gets you thinking in terms of the distance control. And quite frankly, a lot of the folks I meet, really have to focus in on distance control because they, they read the greens pretty effectively. And for the most part, their strokes really aren't that bad. And on a 30-footer, you know, the odds of making a 30, 30-footer anyway aren't that good. So if you can just get it up there close enough to where you can two-putt it and move on to the next hole, it's, it's going to be a lot more effective. And it, it always seems to boil down to distance control, at least in my experience. So it's okay to two-putt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think a lot of people would be happy with a two putt from 30 feet. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So play, uh, let me play devil's advocate for just a moment. So we talk sure. about throwing a pitch, throwing a football, throwing a dart, bowling, all these different things where you're focused on the target. Okay. Mm-hmm. But let's take it to another step. What about somebody who's hitting a baseball? All right. The ball's coming at them. They're looking at the ball the whole time and trying to make sure they can see when they make contact with the ball. Sure. Well, I think they're or, or tennis, or you know, they're reacting to okay. uh, tennis, to, the, to, to the movement of the object. And in golf, it's stationary, so it's not it's not going to move. And the idea is really more focusing in on where you want to project the golf ball. Uh, where you know, again, like in baseball or tennis, like you're saying, there's probably a little bit of that tennis player thinking across the court and certain type of spin on it, but they're having to watch the golf ball rather than the tennis ball to. Uh, make sure they hit it squarely in the racket, and and same for baseball. But in golf, the the object's not moving, so it's it's pretty simplistic with looking at the target, freeze up the motion, and now the golfer can again in putting, at least in this circumstance, have a better sense of how hard to hit it to make it go the right distance. Mm-hmm. What was interesting too about the the first one of the first studies we did with Golf Magazine was that some of the comments we got from the folks who were participants is that. Once they got over the hesitation of looking at the hole and putting, which was you know, awkward for a lot of golfers because they had never tried that, and once they got the feeling of where the club was in relationship to the ball and they got a little confidence in their ability to make some clean contact with the, with the ball, they were commenting that they didn't feel like their body was moving as much. And certainly our observations were that they were, their bodies were more stable during the stroke now, whereas before when they were looking at the golf ball and manipulating the stroke here and there, uh, they really had a lot more body movement. And so, oddly enough, you would, again, kind of counterintuitive, that you would think that not looking at the ball would actually leave more, give more room for body movement. It actually did the reverse in our observations. No, nope. so it actually made the strokes better is what I'm getting to. Right, right. And there's no question that there is an anxiety level um, that comes up when you're not looking at the ball when you're putting. Oh, yeah, for sure, initially, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, and how, I mean, is there a, a amount of time that you feel comfortable with your students spending with this before they take this out onto the course, knowing they're going to be a little more confident with it? Well, I, I, think, it's, it's, I think it's up to the, the golfer. And, and mm-hmm. what I mean by that, I, I don't think everybody has to go out on the golf course and look at the hole while they're putting. Um, because I think for some golfers in, in competition or out on the golf course, that would just be too, too awkward. And they would always have a little bit of confidence issues, uh, depending on you know depending on the break, the the environment they're in, in competition. I mean, simply being out there for score that would always be a little bit more than they'd want to do. But they could certainly practice looking at the hole and taking advantage of that visual cue, getting a sense of how how hard it is to make go the right distance. Um, an example would be quite possibly a golfer out on the golf course looking at the hole while they make their practice strokes and simply gauging. Does that stroke or does that amount of motion, is that going to get me to the hole? Set up to the golf ball, one glance at the target to get that visual confirmation of the distance, make the stroke, and 
putt it, and um, they'd probably be a lot better off. So you don't necessarily have to take this technique out to the golf course and go to the full extent where every putt you're looking at the hole. Oh. Uh, but, it, but it's an option. I mean, there, there's, you know, that's not for everybody, and uh, they, it could be a combination of simply looking at the hole, again, like I said, for practice strokes. Or going the full length, as some players do, like the gentleman you met out on the driving range, or rather the putting green, the other day, they, who actually goes to the full extent of every putt looking at the hole. And did you find that your students and, and the subjects of your study, um, once they started incorporating this into their practice, that they did take it out onto the, the course? Oh, yeah, I think uh, some do. Yeah, some have. Absolutely. And, and then they, others have done variations of it where they have uh, look at the hole while they're doing the practice strokes and then set up to it. Again, have a better feel for how hard they're going to hit it, and then they go ahead and putt looking into the golf ball. Oh, okay, so and so they so mix yeah, it there's up. Variations for it, yeah, sure. Oh, okay, there's, there's so, variations of it. Yeah. So you're not recommending this is the way you should do it from now on. Period. No, I don't think you. No, I don't think you, you can go that far because that would be too much of a leap for a lot of golfers. I mean, that would be just too too awkward. It would probably take a tremendous amount of practice time that, quite frankly, a lot of golfers wouldn't have the time to do. Um, but I do think that for sure. You could take at variations of it. You could do practice strokes. You could go out on the golf course and putt um, looking at the hole out on the golf course. When I'm with students in our golf academy, certainly I can go out there and, and I'm comfortable enough with the stroke looking at the hole and I can show them and demonstrate for them. And actually, we for fun, we have them do it out on the golf course. So the first time they ever tried, they're out on the golf course and they're always somewhat amazed at how quickly they can get their distance control better. Mm. And again, a lot of it's the... The time that people linger over the putt, I think what happens is they stand over the putt for so long. I'm thinking of an example of a, of a woman that was in our golf school this weekend. And I, this is a common thing I think a lot of golfers do is they spend so much time worrying about the break. Mm -hmm. And they spend so much time looking at the grain and they, they spend just countless effort of trying to figure out that last, is it a double break, a triple break? I mean, whatever they're looking for. And then they stand over the putt, and the first time they think about the distance is when they're standing over it, about ready to putt it. They glance at the hole and say, oh, yeah, it's about 45 feet. And they really haven't prepared themselves enough with that how hard to hit it to make it go the right distance. And so in, in her case, she stood over the putt for so long and never even looked at the hole. Hmm. And, and so now she's taking away all the visual potential, or the, she's taking all the, way, taking all the chances she has of getting distance control away from her just because she's not even aware of where the target is. Now she, she's read it perfectly. She knows it's going to break twice and it's a little downhill and, and all that, but she doesn't have a sense of how hard to hit it, which once I showed her this exercise of looking at the hole while she putted, uh, she increased her accuracy I mean, immensely. But, but it was only because she, she brought into play the target, took a little less of the focus off the reading the green, and put it more into the distance control, and now that, had a, that played a, a bigger part for her. What types of golfers did you utilize for this study? Oh, we had golfers that were five handicaps up to 30 handicappers. And what were the ranges of discovery that you found between them? I mean, the better putters were still the better putters, or, or, did, or were the, the golfers with high handicaps become better putters? Well, actually, we did it by group. We had uh, an a equal balance of golfers, and uh, I'll say for, for ease of making it, simple here, uh, group one and group two. We broke the groups into similar ages, years of playing golf, handicap levels. So as a group, they were similar in their golfing experiences and skills and things like that. And then we had each group practice in a different way. One group looked at the hole, the other group did the traditional looking at the golf ball while they wor worked on their distance control. So it was more by group. Uh, certainly some individuals sh showed greater improvement than others uh, by using the drill. I find it real interesting that you talk about that woman who really never even looked at the hole. She she was more yeah. worried about the line. Um, yeah. Why don't you, if you if you can, why don't you walk us through the setup of a putt of what people should be concentrating on what element? I, I would think that once you step up to the ball, you've got to be committed to what your line is at that point. Oh sure, well absolutely, and and, and the you know. A, a, Typical, an observation of mine of the of most golfers out on the golf course is that they 
you know, kind of take you back to the golf court. I mean, when they're getting out of the golf court or they're walking up to the green, they're approaching the green, they very rarely even look at the contours of the green. Mm-hmm. And, and my point uh, with, with golfers and, and in the discussion in the book is, uh, as well with uh, uh, Bob and Kerry, both were agreeing that you know, observation of the green starts off the putting surface from a distance, looking at the contours of the green to get a sense of what, what, what the green is going to do to the golf ball. And then as you approach, by the time you, you're certainly making observations of the putting surface, and by the time you get to the golf ball and mark it and clean it, you should really have a pretty good sense of which way the putt's going to break. Then the attention needs to shift to how hard do I hit it? What's my distance control? And that's where this approach is so effective is because it now, by making, virtually forcing you to look at the hole while you do the putting stroke as well as if you take it to the point of looking at the hole while you putt, it's really at that stage pure distance control. How hard am I going to hit to get to go to the to, get, to go to the hole? And so many golfers spend more time looking at the break, which is certainly important. But on a 20 footer, on a 25 footer, a 15 footer, the speed at which you hit the putt has as big a factor of a, of a chance of it going in as the read of it. If I read it perfectly and hit it eight feet by, I'm not. It's not going to take the break that I'm anticipating. Mm-hmm. So it, it's it's a blend. It's a blend of reading the green. It's a blend of the right distance control, and certainly a blend of the uh, correct mechanics. Mm-hmm. Now, again, most of the time, I find, goodness, we you know, we see a lot of golfers here in our golf academy, and you know, there's there's a lot of good strokes out there, and yet a good stroke with a good read and not the right distance control, uh, they're just they're still three putting. Mm. And that and that's where the focus on looking at the hole, looking at the cup again in either the practice strokes or looking at the at the cup while you're stroking it, is just a great way to focus in on distance control and getting better feel and, and touch. And uh, what about looking at the hole from multiple angles, looking at the, your line from multiple angles, walk on the other side of the hole, looking back towards your ball, going on either side? Uh, would you recommend? Well, as much as you can without slowing down the pace of play. I think that's the the one dilemma with the the circling the hole and, and choosing multiple angles is that uh, you know a lot of times that that's done at a pace that slows down the golfer's routine, therefore influencing the pace of play for the whole the whole group. I think it's it, as long as it's not slowing down the pace of play, it's fine. Uh, it would be interesting to see if a golfer reads the putt more effectively from different angles or from the adding more angles to it to see if they actually get a better read on it. Uh, certainly, I think golfers need to experiment and see which, which angle do they seem to be more accurate with with their read, either the target line or behind the hole or even circling the hole. Uh, but I think for the most part, most golfers, if they at least get some observation of it of the putt as they're walking up to the green, get a sense of maybe the target line view if they feel more comfortable from that view, checking out the break, gauging the break to it, and then from there, shifting right into distance control, they're going to see a lot of improvement once they put the focus on distance control. You talk about athletic intuition. Mm-hmm. Can you explain that? Well, it's, I think an example of it would be just the, uh, the folks that we see when they're working on their putting. Um, you know, they, they, and, and I think we've all had this happen to us when we're standing over a putt, let's say, and we're about ready to stroke it, and then our eyes are looking at the putter blade going back, and we're, we're noticing as we're making the stroke that's going to last a second and a half, oh, the blade's looking a little outside and the face a little closed, and you start adjusting things, and all of a sudden you take a fairly simplistic motion and make it a little bit too hard, mm-hmm. and it gets manipulated. And, and really the idea is that by looking at the hole, you become a little bit, you, t- you take the focus off the mechanics, and now the, maybe the things that you've done with your golf coach back home, you know, working on the stroke, uh, getting the mechanics a little bit more correct, or working on your posture, which would certainly help the mechanics of the putting stroke. Now, by looking at the hole, you free yourself up to a point of where now you can make the stroke a little bit more with with athletic uh, athletic movement. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then same thing, um, certainly, if you're watching people in a, a full swing context or a short game context, watching them make make swings at the golf ball. So, you know, sometimes we get so mechanical that we get bogged down with the mechanics and now lose the athletic shape of the golf swing. We, we lose our natural athleticism. Right. So where does the name instinct putting come from? How did you, how did you get to that? Well, I think it's more just the, the idea of looking at the hole and, and becoming a little bit less mechanical or manipulative with the stroke 
and uh, letting our natural instincts uh, from athletic from an athletic standpoint uh, help us out. Again, I you know maybe the the idea would be to compare it to, um, you know, gosh, if you're five feet away, my athleticism is going to allow me to throw a ball to you at a speed that you can catch it. If you're ten feet away, I'm naturally going to increase the speed of throwing it to get it to you. And just some of the things that we can do as athletes can be pretty simple. Um, and a lot less um, controlled and manipulated like we tend to get when we're looking at a golf swing or a golf stroke and putting, for that matter. I found it real interesting that when I was trying it out on the practice putting green um, that my distance control was far better. Um, What ended up happening is I would, instead of coming up, you know, anywhere from 2 inches to to 15 inches or, or 20 inches short, I would just be hitting just beyond the hole just a little bit if it wasn't going in. Yeah. Um, and so that was one element of it. The other thing that I found really interesting is on short putts, I find myself, I, I have a tendency, I guess, uh, to watch the putter head. I'm so nervous about the line <laughs> that you're laughing at me that I'm watching the putter head and all of a sudden I have a real crappy stroke. And no, I, exactly. And that's, and it's funny how that happens all the time because it's such a delicate motion. I mean, a right. four-footer, a right. downhill four-footer left or right oh. is an extremely difficult putt for one. I mean, tremendous, so, it, it produces a tremendous amount of anxiety. Sure. A- absolutely. And then you're watching the stroke go back and forth. And, you know, the, the golf ball is on the face of a putter such a brief amount of time that there's really no give. If your club face is not aimed up in the right direction at impact, the ball's going to be deflected offline. And what certainly my observation of it as an instructor would be that the more the golfer manipulates things, the more their eyes are catching the stroke not being right, the more they start adjusting. And all of a sudden, a four-footer becomes a very very high anxiety environment because they simply don't have a stroke that's holding up. They're They're looking so much at the stroke and losing just the natural movement that they could probably create. Uh, and again, your, I think your example is perfect. I mean, you're standing over the putt and you're watching the putter blade go back, and all of a sudden now this fairly simplistic motion is becoming a lot more complex. And taking the eyes out of it and having you look at the cup, uh, certainly you can't watch the stroke now. And certainly our observations of it is it, the stroke becomes a lot simpler and a lot more correct. Yeah, uh, it was amazing to me how much improved my stroke was on the shorter putts by not looking at the ball yeah, and sure. just by, by looking at the cup and just, uh, boy, the knees weren't knocking as much. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's very interesting. I think once people get out there and give it a try, they'll be very surprised. We, we were certainly surprised by the results we got. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I, you know, we, we were, well, I mean, skeptics, I guess, is a, a, a fair word because, <laughs> you know, well, well, I mean, if you think about it, I mean, send a bunch of people out on a putting green, have them look at the hole, and they're going to improve their distance control. I mean, come on. That that just didn't seem like it, it'd be very true. And yet, I guess, again, bringing into play the use of the eyes and, and the simplicity of the motion now, uh, it became a lot, uh, very quickly we saw the results. I, I think what was neat for Bob and I when we were watching the golfers go through their ritual and the routines of distance putting and their practicing and doing these random distances, uh, we commented to each other just how simpler their strokes were starting to look and how they gained confidence in the speed at which to put it. And um, it, was, it was very interesting. And, and for sure, I think you experienced it when you went on the putting green the other day. Well, think, yeah, I did. Golf seems to be dictated for amateurs by what happens on the tour. Um, sales of product goes up when somebody's using a new driver or a new putter or, you know, I mean, look, we look at the, uh, the belly putters and the, the tall putters. Um, are there any pros that you have worked with with this method um, or have seen use this effectively? You know, I, I, I know that um, in talking with Carrie and Bob, I mean, they've met some guys who have, um, uh, well, the example of Johnny Miller being out on tour using it, Jim Thorpe uh, using it uh, in tournaments. Uh, some of the players I work with that are the uh, mini tour level and the uh, you know, aspiring PGA Tour player, LPGA Tour players, uh, they, they find it very effective to, to practice that way. Uh, and I, I think it's back to the the... the at the discretion of the golfer, whether they really want to implement that out on the golf course where they're looking at the hole for every putt. Uh, worst case scenario, 
or in, at the least, the golfer should be out on the golf course looking at the hole while they're making their strokes to get a feel for distance. I mean, and you see this with tour players and accomplished players. It doesn't have to be a tour player. You see this with folks who have good short games and can hit shots that are have touch and are delicate and things like that around the green or can get it close to the hole with a chip shot. I mean, they're not looking at the ball when they're doing a practice stroke. They're looking at the pin, kind of getting a sense of how hard to hit it. It's not the, it's, you know, it's, it kind of boils down to it's not that they, when you're standing over a putt that's a 30-footer, for the average golfer, they don't have to worry too much about the stroke. It's not going to be that bad. But what they have to worry about is the distance control. Mm -hmm. And like you were saying, you're using a great example of where you're standing over the putt, and then all of a sudden you're looking at the stroke, and you're looking at the putter blade and wondering if the face is open or closed. And all of a sudden what should be a fairly athletic movement and shouldn't be too far off from being correct now becomes manipulated and changed around a little bit. And, again, that takes the focus off the distance control. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, you know, it's, it's, uh, I think if golfers observed, if the audience were to watch the next tournament they see on TV, they would see folks around the greens looking at the hole, not only when they're putting, at least with the stroke itself, practice strokes before they hit the putt. They're looking at the hole, getting a sense how hard to hit it. But they'd see that in a lot of shots around the greens, not just the putting. Now, again, if they shift into where they're looking at the hole while they're putting, uh, that's fine. Uh, we have found it very effective. Um, again, that's just kind of at the discretion of the golfer, though, whether they want to do that to that extent or not. Yeah, I can visualize watching uh, the pros on tour, uh, and, of course, Tiger comes to mind. But you see that he is walking around the ball, walking around the green, setting up his line. Once he mm-hmm. has his line committed and he stands over the ball, then he's looking at the hole, and and just getting a feel for his distance, whether it's a very short little stroke or a longer mm-hmm. stroke, but you can just see that he's working on, you know, on his distance control before he brings his head back down to the ball. Mm-hmm. And you'll notice that they, all the players, they don't linger over it that long. They don't stand there once they put their, as you say, you're committed to the putt, you're committed to the line, they're committed to how hard hard they're going to hit the putt, and then they go. And an example of this past week with some folks out on the golf course was someone who stood over the putt for an enormous amount of time, never looking at the hole. And then by the time they putted it, they couldn't even tell you how far the putt was. Mm-hmm. They knew it was going to break three times, but they <laughs> couldn't tell you where it was in relationship to them, you know? So it, it's, it's gotta be a little blend of everything. Right. Right. Yeah. What happens in a situation like that? We're recording this just the weekend after the, the British open. Uh, mm-hmm. happen where the ball it's so windy the ball's moving while you're standing there over it <laughs> yeah <laughs> if that's not going to create more anxiety yeah, than that, anything. that had to be oh, i can't imagine that they had to be just uh, i mean beside themselves because how many times you see people walk away from the putter stop and had well I've, so many of the players weren't even grounding their putter to yeah. make sure that they uh Didn't weren't going to be penalized if the ball yeah if the ball moved yeah that had to be uh, i can't imagine that, that had to be, uh, <laughs> <laughs> with the kind I mean, of pressure they're under just oh. because of the, the tournament it is yeah, I'm, I'm sure that they were. <laughs> I'm sure there was a lot of high anxiety going on out there on the golf course. That had to be brutal. Yeah, hey, the wind hey, blowing. The wind, and, right, and the winner didn't shoot under par. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the, I mean, I, uh, it'd be interesting to hear some of the players talk about it, how they had to anticipate the gust of wind on their putting. That would be kind of fun to hear. Yeah, that, there it was, was hard that, enough as it was. Yeah, there was that <laughs> uh, video of the one putt, the replay of the one putt that Greg Norman made, where the ball just like made a turn right in the middle of the line, boop, right into the hole. But I mean, it was blown yeah. right into the hole. Yeah, he, oh, he timed outrageous. it perfect. Yeah, yeah. Hey, page sixty-seven, uh, chapter five mm-hmm. of the book is the principles of effective practice. Mm-hmm. Please address effective practice. Sure. Very important. Sure. Well, I th- I, it's kind of the idea here is that to outline for the reader six conditions of effective practice and how to go about what, what the six are and then also offer some advice on how to uh, accomplish them. You obviously, if you're going to expect your putting or any other part of your game of golf to improve, you've got to go practice. But there are some conditions that you have to keep in mind when you go out and practice. One would be go out when you're motivated. And for the most part, most golfers I know, anytime they go out and practice, they are pretty motivated because they're getting a chance to get out there and enjoy uh, their hobby and have some fun with it. So that's probably not too big of a deal. But at the same time, if you don't want to be there and you've got other things to worry about, then maybe the best thing is to not go out there and uh, work on your putting or your full swing or anything. Uh, practice the right things. 
uh, hopefully in, by the layout of the book, our goal is to give you some things to work on in your putting and to, when you're going out there, have something to focus on to where it's not just a waste of time. Uh, certainly with a clear-cut purpose would be number three. And again, kind of falling under the same umbrella there is go out to, you know, for example, let's say if we're putting into the context of, uh, of a certain type of putt that you struggle with. Well, go out and find those types of putts and work on those. So you maybe, for example, uh, a difficult putt for a lot of the folks that I deal with is something that's downhill left to right, <laughs> which I guess is probably everybody, but uh, working, you know, finding those types of putts, those situations, and trying to develop a better feel for how much the putt breaks, how hard to hit it, and then the reverse could be true for the opposite could be true for the the golfer who who just has difficulty reading the greens, you know, going out and getting some experience, going out to a putting surface, finding the part of the green that has the most uneven lies, and trying putts from all different directions to a hole, and just again through experience. Having a purpose, going out there and saying to yourself, I'm going to work on something very specific that's going to be beneficial to my putting. Uh, number four would be uh, obviously looking uh, for the feedback that you can get. Uh, and, and by that, really, the relevant feedback is really looking at hitting a putt and learning from it. Uh, for example, you've got uphill putts. You're, you're working on some uphill putts, and you start to learn that, because of the, the degree of incline, you have to hit it just a little bit harder. And so you get that feedback that when it's this type of putt, when, it's, when I have this type of uphill portion to it, I have to give it just that little bit more, and I'm going to practice and work on that and get a better feel for how, how does the slope of the green influence the putt and how do I have to adjust the amount of stroke I make. So you're looking for feedback of the ball, what happens, what you learned, and all incorporating that right back into your practice routine. I guess if you were out in the full swing, you'd be looking at the ball flight and thinking in terms of the, the slices caused by the open club face. Let's work on the open club face. Well, the same thing in putting. You'd be looking at the pattern of um, I continue to be short on uphill putts. I'm going to go out and work on my uphill putts and get to where I can adjust the amount of stroke and get the feedback. If, if the ball is going past the hole now, I know that I've accomplished my task. And then number five. This is actually number five is the one that really blew me away. Oh, well, practice the right amount. Yeah. Go ahead and talk about it and see if you address this. But. Well, I, I, in, in our minds, the, the idea of practicing the right amount is really just going out and practicing what you need to work on and then ending, the, ending that session and addressing another issue. I mean, so often we see, you know, golfers – well, for example, on a given day on any putting green, you could go up and watch somebody practicing uh, a bunch of three-footers, straight-in three-footers, which they'll spend an enormous amount of time on those putts and become very efficient with a three-footer. But they don't really spend as much time on maybe some of the putts that are more their scoring putts, which would, let's say it's a 25-footer, which they tend to three-putt from 25 feet uh, more often than they tend to miss a three-footer. So they're focusing in on an area that's certainly important, but is that going to be as relevant to their score in the end? And so it's kind of the, practicing the right amount is practicing the, the areas that are going to be influential to your score. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and also, too, I mean, I, I guess, you know, you could carry this over to other areas of, of practice and say, you know, gosh, do I really need to hit 55 drivers in a row and only 15 seven irons? Oh, bad. You know, you know, it's, it's a balance to what you need to have. Right. You need to practice. Well, here's the line that really blew me away on, on point number five here, and uh, is that you say it seems to be less obvious at first, but stop when you're putting well. Sure. So if, if it's feeling good at that point, don't beat yourself to death on it. Just, okay, I got it. Let's move on. And it won't move on to the next area, sure. Uh, it, it, yeah. Well, that's kind of the example of three footers. You know, making 23 footers in a row is fine, but is that, you know, where, where's the threshold of where that's overkill? Hmm. And I, I think we've all seen the golfer who, the more they practice, the, they kind of, kind of start messing things up a little bit. They start fidgeting and kind of messing around. They get kind of lackadaisical with their putting stroke or sh short game or whatever. And next thing you know, they're not doing so well. And really, it's because they, gone past the point of, of practicing efficiently. Now they're just kind of messing around and they're starting to change their stroke. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. I love the quote it has on the front of the book from Golf Magazine. Get 28% better in 15 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> what, is yeah. well, what does that mean? <laughs> well, that's our friends at Golf Magazine. Yeah, yeah, they, okay, fine. <laughs> yeah, they have, to, uh, they have to sell it. So that was the, uh, the cover to uh, the article that we did a couple of years ago that started this whole process. Was uh, They were looking for that, uh, I think as they would say, the, uh, the, the, the diamond in the rough or the nugget that they could uh, throw out there on the cover. So that's where that was a cover story. Yeah. Well, the book is called Instinct Putting, Putt Your Best Using Breakthrough Science-Based Target Vision Putting Technique. And mm-hmm. it's written uh, collectively by Eric Alpenfels, who we're speaking with, Bob Christina, and Carrie Heath. Eric, thanks so much, and best of luck with the book. I, I think it's great. I think it's a really interesting concept. And now that I have a fuller understanding that I can use it for practice and don't have to worry about taking it on the course, I feel so much better. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm happy I helped you out with that one for sure. Yeah, it's, it was it was a lot of fun to put the book together and work with uh, Carrie and Bob. And uh, certainly our, our goal would be to get folks who struggle with their putting and need to see some improvement in their putting, giving, giving them some techniques and some ways to uh, improve that part of the game. It's, it's way too big a part of your overall score to not address it and use and, and get better at it for sure. 